Paris Hill, Maine. Today, a small and quiet town with leafy streets and well-kept houses. Yet despite its quiet and rural location, it was the home to some giants of the faith. Three families of note that lived here were the Stevens family, the Stowell family, and the Andrews family. J.N. Andrews was the son of Edward Andrews and the nephew of Charles Andrews, a state representative of Maine. Cyprian Stevens had two daughters, one of whom married Uriah Smith and the other married J.N. Andrews. Today, the home of Edward Andrews stands behind me at the Paris Hill Country Club and Cyprian Stevens Farm is located just down the road. But we start the story with another family, when in the spring of 1845, a track by T.M. Preble on the Sabbath made its way to the home of Louis B. Stowell. He set the track aside, but his 15-year-old daughter, Marion, picked it up and decided to read it. She was convinced on the truth of the Sabbath and decided to keep it. She then shared the track with her brother Oswald, and he also decided to keep the Sabbath. They then called J.N. Andrews, who was only 15 years old, but was respected as having an intelligent mind. He read the track and also decided to keep the Sabbath. It was later on that the parents of the Stevens, Andrews and Stowell families decided to keep the Sabbath, which I believe is a key point. It was the teenagers who made the decision to keep the Sabbath based on God's word, regardless of what others thought. This really is the essence of Protestantism and a continuation of one of the key tenets of the Reformation, to follow conviction rather than tradition, to let scriptures be our guide, no matter what others may think. Lewis B. Stowell sent a letter and $10 to the Seventh-day Baptist minister in Hopkinton, Rhode Island, to obtain some more materials. Soon the tracks arrived and a small company of Sabbath-keeping Adventists was established in Paris Hill, Maine. These families would go on to be pillars in the new and fledgling movement that was being birthed. Paris Hill, Maine is also the birthplace of the Review and Herald, today published as the Adventist Review. From August to November of 1850, a magazine was published here called the Advent Review. And then from November 1850 to June 1851, the Review and Herald was published here in a building near this site. It would then move on to Saratoga Springs, New York, Rochester, New York, before moving to Battle Creek, Michigan. In 1856, the Stevens and Andrews families would move to the state of Iowa, and the town of Paris Hill, Maine, would become just a memory of the early beginnings and challenges of Sabbatarian Adventism. Though the action had moved on from this town, their example of faithfulness under conviction lives on today and stands as an example of how we ought to live our lives. It doesn't matter who else makes a decision or what authority is trying to instruct and guide us. We need to be true to the convictions of our conscience first and foremost. It was Peter who said that we ought to obey God rather than man. Good evening, our message tonight is entitled, The Root of It All, The Root of It All. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads as we open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bless us and be with us as we open your word, as we contemplate um, our lives today. May your Holy Spirit speak through to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The text I'd like to begin with, before we... Um, get into our presentation. It's the same one as yesterday, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, 
where the Bible says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The things that are written in the past is to guide us today, it's to give us hope today, and it's to give us comfort as we face the future. With that in mind, I'd like to, uh, if you cast your mind to the screen, there's a prominent publishing association in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's called the Review and Herald Publishing Association. They've been around for over 150 odd years and, and they're a very much established part of the church. They have published books all over the world. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of books have been published by the Review and Herald Publishing Association. Yet the question is, where did they start? And, and also, why did they start where they started? This here is a drone image that was taken in the town of Paris Hill, Maine. Paris Hill, Maine is a sleepy little town in, in, in the middle of the state of Maine where the Review and Herald as a, a magazine first started. Now, the reason why it started there and why in particular this tiny little town in, in, in the middle of Maine became the birth of the Review and Herald magazine and publishing association later on it is fascinating and we're going to go through the reasons as to why that is today. Remember our message is entitled The Root of It All. The Root of It All. A text I'd like to turn your minds to is John chapter 16 and verse 8 which says, and when he, when he comes, talking about the spirit here, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The, the Holy Spirit, one of his jobs, one of the roles, one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to convict. It's to convict. It's to convict. Yesterday we looked at the importance of the importance of honesty. Honesty following as God leads and being honest in yourself to know where God is guiding. Today, the root of it all, in a sense, what lies maybe even lower than that? What is at the bottom of, of, of where we, the, the base, the foundation of our spiritual life? And I would suggest it comes in the word there, in the second line, where it says, and when he comes, he will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. There's something that the Holy Spirit does. And one of the key roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us. When, we, when, we, when, we, when we're about to go into a place that we know we shouldn't go, the Holy Spirit convicts us. When we're about to make a phone call where the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 you're a little bit too angry yet. Don't make that phone call yet. He convicts us to hold off and wait. When we need to apologize to someone, the Holy Spirit convicts us. When we haven't been kind to someone, the Holy Spirit convicts us. When we've done that, that, that sin again, the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit is that member of the Godhead that brings conviction and it's based on that conviction and how we respond to that conviction that determines ultimately whether we really follow God or we don't. God is looking for people that when the Holy Spirit convicts them, they respond to it favorably. They respond to it in a, in a positive way. I'd like to um, share a few stories from the Reformation because the Reformation, in a sense, there, there's something at the root of the Reformation. You know, what was the Reformation all about? Was the Reformation really about um, these certain men and women? Was that, was, was that what the Reformation was about? What did the Reformation discover? What was the, what was the real power of the Reformation? When I look at some of these stories of people there, it reminds me that it wasn't so much the theological stances that they took that was really the strength of the Reformation. When we look at Martin Luther, you know, the just shall live by faith, and we look at John Wesley, the importance of Christian works, and we look at other people, you know, what was the real basis and of the power of the Reformation? I would argue it wasn't the theology of the Reformation. It wasn't the theology of the Reformation, but it was something underlying that. It was something at, further below that that gave the Reformation its power. This photo was taken. We, we had the privilege to be at the, um, at, the, at the home of a woman called Marie Durand. 
And Marie Durand was a, was a French lady. She wasn't a theologian. She wasn't a scholar. She wasn't a, a professor or a pastor. She was simply, uh, her brother was a pastor. And because he had taken a call for ministry, he essentially sentenced all his family to either a life on the run or a life in prison or even worse, death once they got to prison. And she, um, she, she, this is the photo taken, uh, the house, it says Marie Durand, she was a prisoner. And if you know your French, you can say she was a prisoner for 38 years at the Tower of Constance. For 38 years at the Tower of Constance, she was a prisoner. An incredibly long amount of time, 38 years, to spend in this building here. There's two floors there. There's the upper floor and then there's the lower floor. And while she was there in the upper floor of this prison, she was in that room, in that room alone with other women for 38 years, through the whole decade of her 20s, through the whole decade of her 30s, through the whole decade of her 40s. And then at the age of 56, she was finally released. When she was there in that prison, she could have, she could have been released any time she was willing to say two words, I recant, I recant, I recant. If she had said those two words, she would have been released from prison. But she refused to say those two words. She says, no, there's something, you know, I, I, I was brought here to prison because my brother's a pastor and he's a Protestant and I'm a Protestant as well. And I'm going to stand by my convictions and I'm not going to go. I am not going to go. I, I will stand on my convictions. I will be who I am. I will live my convictions, even if that means even if that means heartache, even if that means pain, even if that means uh, a not, you know, uh, not a good life. She stood by her convictions. She stood by them. Here's the picture of the room today. It looks quite picturesque with all the nice mood lighting and so on. But, you know, there was a hole in the middle of the room. And then through that hole, the, the food would be thrown up. And down that hole, the human waste would be thrown down. And, and they would live there through the cold winters and the warm, hot, sticky summers uh, with you know, very little facilities to wash or do anything like that. And there was a word that she scratched into the, the, the stone around the cover. She scratched the old French word register, register, register in the old French is resister in the new French, which is translated to English as resist, resist. I will live my convictions. I will resist, resist. I will resist. She lived her convictions. She lived them. And it wasn't an easy living of her convictions. I think of other reformers who lived by the principle that their convictions is at the basis of their spiritual life. Their convictions are at the basis of their spiritual life. This is another uh, reformer. His name is John, John Wycliffe. He is one of the greatest of the reformers. In fact, his church is just, just a few miles from Leicester. And if you've never been there, then I would encourage you to go there. You, you, you just drive south of Leicester about eight miles and you come to Lutterworth. And there in Lutterworth, you have the church where he was the pastor of. It's also the church where he finished up his translation of the Bible into the English language. The first time ever that the Bible had been translated into English was completed in Lutterworth, just about eight miles from Oxford. And it was while he was working there that the, the Roman church, there, there was no other church back then. I mean, even though the Protestant Reformation started really in the 1500s, John Wycliffe was way ahead of his time theologically with the ideas he had and, and, and so on. But there was still only a Catholic church. No one had broken away yet. Martin Luther was the first to break away. No one had broken away yet. But his theology, his philosophy and what he taught was far removed from Rome far removed from Rome. And so they attacked him relentlessly. There were several times where they had papal bulls to summon him to Rome, but he did not go. And there were several times when John Wycliffe, you know, it looked like his life would be over. It would snuff him out, but he was protected by God and he ended up being able to die a natural death. There's a quotation from him from Wiley's book two, chapter 13, where he says, with whom think you are you finally contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? No with truth, 
truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. He says, you think you're battling with me, this old man who's about to die? No, you're not. You're not battling with me, this old man who's about to die. You're battling with truth, truth that is stronger than you and truth that will overcome you. At the foundation of the Reformation is this idea, is this idea that there is a, 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 a power stronger than the individual. There is a power stronger than, than just the person. And that is the truth of God's word. And we ought to base our life on that and live with a conviction based on that. Wycliffe, Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 81, was one of the greatest of the reformers in breadth of intellect, in clearness of thought, in firmness to maintain the truth and in boldness to defend it. He was equaled by few who came after him. He was one of the greatest of the reformers, far, far, far ahead of his time, I would say. Martin Luther was another one of the great reformers. In fact, you know, he's often lauded as one of the most prominent reformers for the, the role he did in really breaking away from Rome. He never wanted to break away from Rome. It was never his intention. But Martin Luther lived by a principle that we see through some of the quotations and speeches that he made. And, and, and that principle would only take him in one trajectory, and that was away from the church. The Roman church stood by the Bible, but more than the Bible, they stood behind what we call tradition. They stood behind the council of the church. And Martin Luther says, no, we should stand by the Bible. That should be where we stand, and it should be what we, we stand on. Notice here, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience, he says, and this is, this is really the foundation of the Reformation, which in turn became the foundation of Adventism. My conscience is captive to the word of God. You know, as a church, we say today, you know, we are the people of the book and we are the church of the book. And if it's not in the Bible, we don't believe it. You know, we are able to look back in hindsight and look at some of the reformers and realize that even though they said they stood by the Bible, there were certain things that they did that were not, as we would understand in our fuller knowledge today, biblical. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we don't judge them according to what we know now, but according to the, the discoveries they made then. Nevertheless, they had this foundational principle that their conscience, their conscience, as the Holy Spirit convicted them, their conscience is captive to the word of God. He went on and said, I cannot and I will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. My conscience is captive to the word of God. The assembly stood in amazement. It says in book Great Controversy, page 161. Speechless of what they just seen and heard. And they said to him again, I mean, it was amazing. After that, that, that powerful speech, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot do otherwise. So God help me. After that powerful speech, they still say, uh, do you want to retract? Do you want to retract? To which he responds, may God be my helper. I will retract nothing. I stood by what I just said. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I stand on God's word. And for a Christian to go against his conscience is neither right nor safe. It was somewhere near this spot, whether it's exactly where this slab stone is or not, I guess historians could debate that. But it was somewhere near this spot where Martin Luther stood and said those famous words in 1521. Now we today come from a church where we talk a lot about conviction. We talk a lot, talk a lot about how the Holy Spirit needs to guide us. Yet when Martin Luther said those words, my conscience is captive to the word of God, for a Christian to go against his conscience is neither right nor safe. When a, when, a, um, when a professor or a preacher said that back in 1521, that was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. This was a new idea that, that, that we would have our mind captive to the word of God, that the word of God be what it, it should be what guides us. That was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. And it forms the basis as to who we are as a church. John Huss or Jan Hus, he was called before the, um, what would you say, the council, the council of Constance. 
He was arrested. He was called before the Council of Constance. And there they had a trial. Today you can visit the church where they, they had his trial. You can actually, you, you, they actually know exactly what row he was sitting on. It's kind of surreal to sit on the same pew where you know John Huss was sitting during his trial. Number 26 or 29, I think it is. One of those two. And he was asked to renounce his errors. And he said these words. <coughs> what errors, said Huss, shall I renounce? I know myself guilty of none. I call God to witness that all I have written and preached has been with the view of rescuing souls from sin and perdition. And therefore, most joyfully, will I confirm with my blood the truth which I have written and preached. He says, I don't know what errors you're talking about. I don't know what you're on about. He said, you know, I'll confirm with my blood the truth that I've written and preached, but uh, I don't know. If I'm guilty of any errors, I have simply tried to live a life where my conscience, my conscience is true to God's word. The picture there on the left is, is well, there's a few. The, the one on the right, top right, is just a, a uh, kind of a circular statue that goes round and round in a circle. And it's actually a, a, a picture. It's, a, it's a, a statue of a woman. In fact, it's a statue of a prostitute, really, because when, when, when they had the Council of Constance and the, there was the, the, the population of the town for about two or three years was swelled by about, I forget, five or 10,000 priests, uh, it, the, what should I say? One of the legacies of, of having all these Catholic priests there was that they needed um, all these women to keep them, to keep them entertained. And so... Uh, remembering the Council of Constance, they, they remember it with a statue of a, a woman of circumstance, which is rather interesting. But the, the, the picture on the bottom right is the, the church where he had his trial. And the picture on the left is the spot where he was martyred, where he was burned for his faith. He was asked to renounce his errors and he said, I know myself guilty of none. The reason why the Adventist church, in a sense, looks back at the reformers and says, what can we, you know, what, what can we be inspired with them? Is because they have that same principle that guides us in our church ever since the beginning. And it was the principle, not so much the doctrines that they discovered, though that was important. And though we do hold on to many, though not all of the doctrines, the reformers rediscovered. But it's the principle, because it's the principle of our conscience captive to the word of God. You see, Martin Luther, you know, he, he, he had quite a few theological errors, and that's okay. He had quite a few theological errors. But that one principle that goes beyond his life, it goes beyond his teachings. And, and that one, when that one principle is taken up by other people, it is what guided us and motivated us and, and, and pushed us forward. You know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? That phrase there, when it says they were cut to the heart, that's another terminology or a way of saying they were convicted. They were convicted. The Holy Spirit was speaking to them. Their mind, they were convicted as to where they should go. And they say, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? I want us to go back to that beginning picture that we, we, talk, we, we looked at at the beginning. The picture of that sleepy town in Maine. Because the foundation of the Reformation, you could say, was this idea that man ought to follow God as he is convicted by his word. That's the foundation of the Reformation. And I would argue it's also the foundation of the Adventist church as well. We, we didn't just come along uh, as a culmination of all of these doctrinal things. Oh, we just add a few doctrines to the top and we carry on. No, 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 no. The foundation of the Adventist church. And when you look at the stories of the people involved, it's people that were convicted by the Holy Spirit, that were convicted uh, how they should live, that were convicted and followed it. When I think back to Paris Hill, Maine, there's a few people that you need to kind of know about as it relates to Paris Hill. You had Louis B. Stowell. And Louis B. Stowell had a 15-year-old daughter called Marion. Also, 
you have Brother Oswald and Jay and Andrews. So these are some of the families there. Three families. The Oswald family, the Stowell family, and the Andrews family. Three families that have, would have a significant impact on the future of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Let me, let me kind of connect them to you. Lewis B. Stowell had a daughter whose name was Marion. And in their house, they received a tract, a pamphlet on the Sabbath. And he looked at the pamphlet. I don't know if he studied it, but he just didn't really pay much attention and put it down on the table. Kitchen table, coffee table, some table. Paid no attention to it. His daughter, though, Marion, picked up the brochure. She read through the brochure from cover to cover, which gave the argument as to why we needed to keep the Sabbath. After reading it through, she says, hmm. She shares it with her 17-year-old brother. And a 17-year-old brother says, yeah, we need to keep the Sabbath. Now, 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 remember, their parents had read it and had ignored it or disregarded it. Now, Marion, the daughter, shares it with her brother. And the two of them make a decision. We will keep the Sabbath. We'll keep the Sabbath. We'll keep the Sabbath. So the teenagers, it was the teenagers who made the decision based on God's word and convicted by the Holy Spirit to keep the Sabbath. This is fascinating. It's the teenagers, because the Holy Spirit is guiding them and because the, uh, the, the Bible is, is, is teaching them, they decide to keep the Sabbath. They then go across to the Andrews family. And as they go across to the Andrews family, they, 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 they share it with Brother and, uh, Jay and Andrews, who at the time was 14 years old. And Jay and Andrews, John Nevin Andrews, who would become, you know, a later GC president, he would become editor, he would become the first missionary that our church sent out. Jay and Andrews was a, was, a, was a powerful, powerful writer, preacher, administrator, leader. They shared it with him when he was 14 years old. And Jay and Andrews read it and he said, yeah, we should keep the Sabbath. So you've got Jay and Andrews, you've got Marion, and you've got her brother. All three of them make a decision, we're going to keep the Sabbath. Now, what happens is their parents then, following the conviction of the teenagers, the parents then decide to read the pamphlet and the Andrews parents, the Stowell parents and the Oswald parents, three families, all decide to keep the Sabbath as well. All of them decide. Now, Oswald, I believe it was the Oswald family. I believe this is, this is a photo here of Jay and Andrews' home. Jay and Andrews' home today is a, uh, is a golf club. The Paris Hill Country Club. They've turned his home into a golf club. So it's still there, but it's not a, it's not a museum or anything like that. It's a, it's a country club or something like that. But they, so you've got the Andrews family. Jay and Andrews reads it. He's convicted. His parents read it. Uh, the Stowell family, Marion and her brother read it. And the parents follow. Then you have the Oswald family. This, this, this house here is the old Oswald home. They read it, the children read it, make a decision to keep it, and the parents follow as well. The, the two daughters of the Oswald family actually, incidentally, would grow up to marry two Adventist pioneers. One of the, the, the Oswald daughters would marry Jay and Andrews, and the other Oswald daughter would marry Uriah Smith. Uriah, so you've got some powerful um, connections coming out of this decision it all started with a 14 or 15 year old girl who read a pamphlet, pamphlet, decided that she would keep the Sabbath. She then shared it with her brother, who shared it with Jay and Andrews, who shared it with their parents. Underlying all of this is this, is this conviction that lies at the root of everything. This picture here is taken from Paris Hill. No, sorry, not Paris Hill. It's taken from Washington, New Hampshire. There's a sign outside the, 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 the town that says the birthplace of the Seventh-day Adventist church. It says, uh, in April 1842, a group of citizens in this town banded together to form the first Christian society. In the Adventist movement of 1842 to 43, they espoused the Advent hope. In January of 1862, these Washington Sabbatari Sabbath keepers, after meeting for many years as a loosely knit group organized as the first Seventh-day Adventist church. Take the, you know, it tells you how to find it. So this church really has, as a church building, would be one of the longest keeping Sabbath keeping churches 
in our denomination. Um, it goes all the way back. And it was in this building where there was a preacher who came by. His name was Frederick Wheeler. He was a, what would you say, itinerant preacher. They would call him circuit preachers in those days. He'd just go on a circuit preaching around. And he's preaching in this church. And then in his congregation was a lady called Rachel Preston Oaks. And he preaches a sermon. It's a communion service. And he, pre and she, he preaches a service. And she's there listening. And, and, and she says later on, she almost decided to stand up in the middle of his sermon. But, but she didn't. She refrained. After the sermon, she went to speak to him. And, and she said to him, you talk about keeping the commandments. Yet you are breaking one of the commandments. You are breaking commandment number four. For commandment number four says that we should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And today is Sunday and we're in here on church on Sunday. Now, Rachel Preston Oaks had roots in the Seventh-day Baptist church. She, she had strong Sab a, a strong Sabbath background. She was going to church on Sunday that, that, that day because there was no other churches in the area. And it was just kind of, you know, the best she could do, so to speak. But when the preacher spoke about the importance of keeping the commandments rather than keeping her light under a bushel she went to go and speak to the minister and shared with him the truth that she knew frederick wheeler later said that when she spoke to me it cut deeply here i was preaching the gospel and instead of getting accolades and affirmation at the door all he all all he got at the door was a woman who told him that he's breaking the commandments and he needs to reevaluate what, what he's teaching and what he's preaching Honesty is the best policy. Conviction, based on God's word, is what has guided our denomination since the start. He has truth shared with him. He goes home and he studies it out. And he realizes that this young lady in his congregation, Rachel Preston Oaks, is right. And he goes home and he makes a decision based on God's word and under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that he's going to keep the Sabbath. He'll keep the Sabbath. Frederick Wheeler became a Sabbath keeper. He then became, when the Seventh-day Adventist church started, he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And he served our denomination in various capacities until his death in 1910. His gravestone simply says that he was a pioneer minister of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Conviction. 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 He lived not far from here, and this house actually has strong roots in the Sabbath movement, Sabbatarianism. This, church, this house here is just about a mile away from the Washington, New Hampshire church, and it was the home of a man called Cyrus Farnsworth. He would go on to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, what happens is Frederick Wheeler has heard about the Sabbath. Cyrus Farnsworth also has heard about the Sabbath. And there's another man who's more known to us as Adventists. His name is Joseph Bates. He's also studying about the Sabbath. The Holy Spirit's guiding him. As he's studying about the Sabbath, and he lived today, a car drive is probably a good, a good four-hour car drive from this house. He hears about some Sabbath keepers up there in Washington, New Hampshire, and he decides he's going to go visit them. Now, remember, before cars, it would have taken him probably two days to get up there. So he makes his way up to Washington, New Hampshire, and he somehow finds these people, Frederick Wheeler and Cyrus Farnsworth. They meet inside this house. And as they meet inside this house, they probably studied the Bible somewhere behind the window on the right. Somewhere behind that window. They studied the Bible throughout the day. And as they study the Bible on the Sabbath, they realize the seventh day truly is the Sabbath. It's not Sunday. And all three of these men, make a decision. They call it the Sabbath pact, that you're going to keep the Sabbath, I'm going to keep the Sabbath. You keep the Sabbath, I, let's all make this decision. We're going to keep the Sabbath because we see it in God's word and conviction is guiding us. They keep it. It was after that meeting when Joseph Bates went home, probably two more days home, as he gets back to Fairhaven, Connecticut. As he gets back there, He's crossing a bridge one on that morning he gets home and someone says to him, what's the news, Captain Bates? He used to be a captain on a, uh, a sea ship. And they say, what's the news, Captain Bates? And he says, the news is the seventh day is the Sabbath. He carries on walking. Famous little interaction between him and something else, someone else. He had been studying the Sabbath before that. 
Now he has a meeting with other Sabbath keepers. He's convicted. And his convictions drive him. What's the basis? The basis where the roots of our church will guide us is this idea that individuals, whether they're young, as in the case of the three teenagers in Paris Hill, Maine, or whether they're older, as in the case of Joseph Bates, no matter who they are, no matter what age they are, what unites them is, is this idea that we will be true to our convictions based on God's word. What's the Holy Spirit convicting you of today? The foundation of our spiritual life is the convictions the Holy Spirit lays upon us and guides us in the way we go. The roots of our church lie with people, individuals, who were convicted and then who followed it. You know, these Adventists to they all have connections somehow. As I mentioned to you, Rachel Preston Oaks and Frederick Wheeler, they have a connection from Washington, New Hampshire. Jay and Andrews heard about the Sabbath and he grew up to become a, a, a powerful um, pioneer of our church. Joseph Bates was convicted about the Sabbath. He went to Washington, New Hampshire, met with Frederick Wheeler, Cyrus Farnsworth, and keeps the Sabbath. James and Ellen White, James and Ellen White, she never had a vision on the Sabbath, at least not initially. She read a pamphlet that Joseph Bates wrote. And then after reading the pamphlet that Joseph Bates wrote, James and Ellen White decided that they would keep the Sabbath. Imagine one of your most powerful converts to the truth is Ellen and James White. And that accolade goes to Joseph Bates for writing the pamphlet that convinced them to keep the Sabbath. Uriah Smith, another long time, 50, 60 years of service in our church, he was also convicted by the pamphlet that Joseph Bates wrote. What lay at the heart of those in Washington, New Hampshire, those in Paris Hill, Maine, Joseph Bates, who then convinced James and Ellen White and Uriah Smith, was conviction. 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 And my question as we close today is, what is God convicting you of? Does that form the basis of the early founders of our church? And our church would grow from there. And that seed of the Reformation, where Martin Luther, John Huss, Marie Durand, John Wycliffe, that seed of the Reformation where they said, I'm just going to follow my convictions no matter what. That seed of the Reformation was picked up by certain young people and older people uh, in the early days of the Adventist church and it has grown and blossomed ever since. And we live on that legacy today, that legacy, that legacy of conviction. We are not Adventists by culture. We are not Christians by culture. We don't go to church just because it's the thing to do. It needs to be that there's a, a biblical foundation for what we do. And there's conviction that drives us in our day to day, week by week, month by work, month, spiritual interactions. May God be the one who guides us. May God be the one who guides us. May God be the one who guides us in our spiritual life. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads as we close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to convict us, continue to lead us, and continue to guide us in our spiritual lives. And may we be honest and follow the promptings of your Holy Spirit, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.